he should not become a ruler, and he would never become a tyrant. The only prophecy attributed to a young boy named Joseph Jugashvili was accidental death in young childhood, but owing to unbelievable circumstances, he survived. As gratitude to God for his salvation, He graduated from a religious school and entered a theological seminary. He planned to be a priest until he met a man who changed his life. After that meeting, he changed his name and date of birth. He started to lead a double life Soon the world would know him under the name of Stalin, literally meaning a man made of steel, a cruel ruler deprived of emotions and feelings. Only a few friends would remember the old Joseph, a timid and shy boy from the town of Gori. What happened to that boy after the tragic accident in Gori? Who made him change? And why did a shy seminarist turn into a bloody murderer and despot? You will uncover the secrets of Joseph Jugashvili, the secrets which, if disclosed, could lead to the death sentence. You will see two horoscopes of Joseph Stalin and hear a sensational discovery made by astrologists based on the ruler's death mask. Тот образ вождя, который нам внушали с детства, этой маской сразу разрушается. It happened in 1890 in a small town of Gori in Georgia. A choir of boys were singing a canticle on the street. A phaeton was approaching. Suddenly, the horse jerked at its reins and neighed. It happened so quickly that the children and their teacher didn't understand what was going on. The horse galloped towards the singing boys. They all ran away, except for 12-year-old Soso. The horse kicked Soso over. Soso appeared to be dead. If the horse had kicked Soso in the head, it could have changed the history of the Soviet Union forever. The 12-year-old could have died under the Phaeton's wheels, or he could have died of smallpox when he was five. He could have died before his first birthday, just like his brothers. But he was destined to live a long life. For a small Georgian boy, Gori was a godforsaken town. The son of a shoemaker and a laundress, he would go on to become the leader of the largest country on earth. He would be known to the world as Joseph Stalin. In 1932, Soviet newspapers remembered that accident in Gori and, furthermore, published an interview with Stalin's mother. In that interview, she told of how her child Soso had been a very sickly, timid boy. Finally, she admitted it would have been better if he'd become a priest. Stalin could hardly contain his anger. It took him 30 years to gain absolute power. For 10 years, he held power in his hands, but was surrounded by enemies who raked through his past, trying to find some compromising information that would destroy him. But they would fail. The same day, the Politburo of the Central Committee, governing body of the Communist Party, received an angry letter saying, avoid any new interviews with my mother and any other unnecessary publicity into our newspapers. Spare me those scoundrels search for sensations. Until Stalin's death, his official biography contained only three phrases. Born in Gori, 
commenced revolutionary fight at the age of 15, headed the party and the state after Lenin's death. Stalin suppressed any attempts to shed light on his youth. What was the people's father hiding? A strong kick, no internal damages. A doctor prescribed rest and a good diet. Ekaterina Jugashvili, or Keke, as she was known by her neighbors and relatives, shed bitter tears over her son. How could her only son die from a horse kick? Keke leant over the boy. God, why do you make him suffer so? A doctor said, good diet. Where do I get the money? My husband will come soon, drunk and impoverished. Beso, the shoemaker, always spends everything he earns in the pub. He doesn't care about his crippled son. Once the kid almost died because of his father. The tragedy happened when Joseph had just celebrated his sixth birthday. Keke worked as a laundress at the house of a wealthy wine merchant. From morning till night, she rinsed linen in the ice-cold waters of Kura, and at night, she darned the merchant's shirts. Her husband, Visarian, Besso, made shirts during the day and in the evening, wasted his money in the pub. Sosa was left alone and begged God not to allow night to return. For at around midnight every night, his father would come back from the pub and all hell would break out. However, that night, Visarian came earlier than usual. His wife put supper on the table and quickly returned to her sewing work. This made her husband angry. How humiliating. She should stand at his side while he is eating. Visarian rushed over to his wife and started beating her. Soso, in an attempt to protect his mother, rushed over to his father. But his father grabbed him by the collar and threw him to the floor before kicking him hard. Hearing Keke's awful cries, the neighbors rushed over and tied the hooligan up. Two weeks later, Soso found blood in his urine. The father had damaged his kidney. Visarian Jugashvili drank hard. He often came home without his belt, the last thing for a Georgian to do. What was going on in his soul? What grief was he trying to drown in wine? Why did he vent his spleen upon his only son and wife? No one will ever know. In an attempt to explain those fits of anger, some biographers of Stalin have suggested that Besso the shoemaker took revenge on his wife and hated his son because he was not the real father. Since Stalin's death, several possible real fathers have come to light. However, only two of them were the focus of rumor. В нынешнем городе Горе, несмотря на то, что там почитает Сталин, там все убеждены, что э, настоящим э, отцом Сталина был Игнатошвили, купец тамошний. Ayakov Egnatashvili was a rich wine merchant. Keke worked for him. He took pity on the mother and son and often helped them with money and food. And later, he paid for Soso's studies at the Gori Theological School. This financial support is confirmed in the memoirs of Stalin's mother. They were found recently in the state archives of Georgia. That generosity can hardly be deemed a confirmation of a relationship between the master and his laundress. There is evidence that Ayakov Egnatashvili was just a very kind and sentimental person. He did not have his own children, and that's why he helped the children of others. But humans always remain human. 
There were so-called well-wishers in Gori who told Visarion that the master of charity had other motives. And he tormented his wife with jealousy. Young Joseph heard it all. What was he able to understand at the time? The older he became, the more contempt he felt towards his mother. Что касается матери Сталина, потому как Сталин к ней относился, можно предположить, что он считал себя действительно ублюдком, бастардом. Сами по себе слухи о том, что он незаконно рожден, его, конечно, травмировали. Детскую, юношескую психику такие вещи очень сильно травмировали. There is evidence from one of Stalin's contemporaries that once, during a conversation, he called his mother a whore. Was this bitter conclusion based on his childhood experience? It's unlikely. Usually, people keep such thoughts to themselves, especially lonely, selfish people like Stalin. It means that this confession, which seemed so sincere, was for some reason beneficial. But why? He wanted those rumors about him. A supposition that Stalin's real father was a well-known Russian traveler named Prezhevalsky was on everybody's lips. Back then, people could be wiped off the face of the earth for being rude about Stalin. It looks as though Stalin wanted to turn those rumors to his benefit. The Tsar of the huge empire, with Russians as the dominating nation, preferred that his father be an outstanding Russian scientist than a Georgian drunk. Except for the likeness in appearance, there are no other confirmations that Prezhevalsky was Stalin's father. Stalin's temper does not leave any room for doubt. Besso the irresolute, revengeful, despotic shoemaker can be clearly seen in Stalin. He hated his father and was ashamed of him. But with age, he became increasingly like his father. The day the boy was hit by a phaeton, his mother felt shock. She urgently needed money she went to the man who never helped her, to Ignatashvili, the merchant. He expressed sympathy for her and generously gave her money to buy medicines and food for the child. Keke prudently divided the money into several portions and hid them so that her drunkard husband could not find them. Next day, she saw that the hiding place had been discovered and that the money was gone. That evening, Besso, drunk as usual, returned home. His wife rushed over to him and asked where the money was. Besso's eyes became bloodshot. He demanded to know where she had got the money. Keke had to confess. He behaved as though he'd caught her cheating. Besso rushed at her. Soso grabbed a knife and threw it at his father's back. But he missed. He assumed his father would kill him. But instead, Besso took the knife and asked, Could you really kill me, son? And in his eyes, he read, Yes. Several years later, a book by a Georgian writer Kazbeki titled Patricide would get into Joseph's hand. One of the book's heroes, a noble robber and people's venger, would leave a lasting impression. His name was Koba. Later, a young revolutionary Joseph Jugashvili would take it as his nickname. Soso will never forget the day when he laid his hands on his father. He felt a sense of satisfaction. Those offenses could not be forgiven. They needed to be avenged. A single occurrence at the theological school where he studied convinced him that this conclusion was right. Coming soon.
Stalin's hidden defect. Why didn't he take his shoes off in the presence of strangers? A bloody revenge upon a betrayer friend. How an executioner was born. Gurdjieff, the occultist. A life-changing prophecy for a theological school student, Stalin. Why did Stalin change his date of birth? An unbelievable discovery using a death mask. Pius Keke believed that becoming a priest would be the most worthy career for her only son. When Soso entered the Gori Theological School, she was overjoyed. She didn't realize that Joseph had only chosen to become a priest to annoy his father. Vissarion wanted Soso to become a shoemaker because he believed he was stupid. On hearing this, nine-year-old Soso went crazy and resolved to prove that he had talent. He would get a degree and become a priest. He would become a metropolitan and then a patriarch. His father would regret what he had said. Soso became a clever, diligent student. Teachers said only good things about him. This boosted his self-esteem. Initially unsociable and taciturn, he began to take part in school activities and soon he made a real friend. Soso loved him with all his heart. He had never had any friends. He was glad that finally there was someone to talk to and to share his thoughts. It was to this boy that Soso revealed his big secret. He did not know yet what betrayal meant. On summer days, senior students were allowed to go to the river to swim, accompanied by a teacher. The 13-year-old boys splashed around, but only Soso stayed on the bank. He refused to swim and wouldn't even walk barefoot in the sand along the bank. It was not for the first time, and now his schoolmates refused to believe that he was just afraid of catching cold. They decided to find out why Soso had not taken his shoes off. Один из сверстников, видя, что Иосиф Джугашвили с неохотой снимает обувь, как-то над ним слегка пошутил, говорит: "Ты что, у тебя там скрывается дьявольская копытца?" Soso stiffened. Who said that? He could not believe his ears. He recognized the voice of his friend. Let's take his shoes off. You'll see it with your own eyes. Soso's reaction slowed down. This psychological feature of stiffening in critical situations first manifested itself during the accident with the Phaeton. All the children scattered in different directions. Joseph was so scared he couldn't move. As a result, he was severely injured. He had the same reaction in June of 1941. The news that the war had broken out shocked Stalin so much that he became utterly speechless and hid himself away at his summer house. Molotov had to announce a general mobilization. Only 10 days later, Stalin, emaciated and wizened, would find the strength to make a speech to his people. He couldn't move. Fear had paralyzed his will. His schoolmates knocked him to the ground and started to take off his shoes. He fought back, but it was an uneven confrontation. Fortunately, the teacher stepped in. Joseph was left alone. He wiped away the tears of humiliation while his former friend was jeering at him, just like the others. Devil, we will bring you out into the open. Stalin's medical card says, webbing of fingers on left foot. The nature of that mutilation is unknown. It may be the consequence of the accident with the Phaeton, since witnesses said the Phaeton ran over the boy's feet. 
On the other hand, it may be a congenital defect, which is common for children of alcoholics. This defect has a very unpleasant name, Devil's Hoof. Soso felt shy because of it and hid the defect. The only person to whom Soso entrusted his secret was that boy who organized the persecution on the riverbank. They were in the bathhouse and Joseph showed him the mutilation. He was Soso's friend and promised him to keep it a secret. In the end, he betrayed him and tried to dishonor him in front of the others. That accident changed his attitude towards people for the rest of his life. Trust no one, since even a friend may betray you. He never made another friend. There were some acquaintances whom he used. There were comrades. But he carefully locked all his secrets and personal worries deep inside his soul. After the accident, Soso longed for revenge. The betrayer must regret what he had done. Joseph Jugashvili did not forgive offenses and humiliations. After the incident, Soso became friends with the toughest boy in the school, whose name was Zaradza. Several months later, Zaradza, on Soso's order, attacked the betrayer. Soso watched the boys fight, but did not join in. He felt satisfaction watching his one-time friend writhing in pain, especially when he started begging for mercy. He felt power over another human being for the first time. He was the only one who could decide whether the offender should live or die. A thought flickered through his head. The betrayer should die. The victim wheezed and choked with blood. Suddenly, Joseph saw a teacher running to them and told Zaredze to stop the execution. After the beating, the victim was sent to hospital where doctors claimed that it was pure chance that the boy had survived. The incident was reviewed by the administrative board of the school. Joseph was scared since punishment looked inevitable. In the end, the hired executioner, Zaradze, was expelled and Soso was left alone. After all, he was the best student and had not actually taken part in the violence. When everything was over, Joseph breathed a sigh of relief. He realized that revenge should be carried out by others. It was not so sweet but much safer. Many years later, he would use this principle to build a powerful machinery of repression. The effect would be astonishing. For a long time after dethronement of the personality cult, people would say, the blood of millions is on the hands of Eshov, Beria and others. And Stalin, as a kind of czar, did not know anything, and hence was not guilty. Joseph graduated from the theological school with honors. He passed with an excellent Mark 10 out of 12 examination disciplines. The diploma allowed him to continue studies at the Tiflis Theological Seminary. Furthermore, as the best graduate, Joseph Jugashvili was exempt from paying for his education and the government paid for it. His mother was happy. Her dream had come true. Her son would make a career in the church and then everything in his life would be perfect. Let God give her the chance to stay alive till that moment. Joseph listened to his mother and thought of the event that had shattered his belief in God. He couldn't tell Keke about that because he himself was afraid to admit it. But the recollection of that event did not leave him. When he was in the second form at school, he and his friends saw a public execution for the first time. Their teacher had taken them there to show where sinners end their days. At the gibbet. But the 12-year-old teenagers were depressed by what they saw. 
Their minds could not match the commandment, do not kill, which was preached at school with the execution of two peasants. Especially as during one of the executions, a rope broke. At that moment, Soso breathed a sigh of relief. There is an unwritten rule that no one could be executed twice. But then he looked on with astonishment. The rope was replaced. The priest on the scaffold turned away indifferently, and the peasant was hanged. When the shock was over, Soso believed that he had been fooled at the theological school. In real life, common people and even priests breach God's commandments. After graduation, he reached a crossroads. He longed to leave Gori and enter to a big, wide world in order to change his fate. But he was eaten up with doubt. He did not see why he should have to enter the church. He had nothing to prove to his father any longer. Several years had passed since Vasarian Jugashvili was killed for his debts in the pub. Should he become a seminary student for the sake of the mother? She would be glad. She believed that sooner or later, her son would make his way to the top of the church hierarchy. She didn't ask whether his faith was strong or whether he was worthy of such a reward. Suddenly, Joseph understood. It was not faith that mattered, but power. He would be worshipped. He would be respected. He could remit sins or impose punishments. He would be like a god on earth. As for his doubts, should it not be seminary's job to strengthen his belief in God? He suffered. Everything turned out to be different from what he expected it to be. The strictest regime was established at the seminary. Endless church services, studies, prayers, a two-hour walk around the town, and prayers again. At 10 in the evening, candles were put out and the seminary was plunged into a deep sleep. Time after time, Joseph regretted his decision to continue his studies. In that semi-prison atmosphere, dreams about his forthcoming career and his future grandeur looked unrealistic. He felt like an innocent prisoner. He was 17 and in despair. Recently, he read a book by Darwin, Origin of Species, and made the final conclusion that they were deceived at the seminary. God did not exist. But what did exist? What should he believe in and strive for? His eyes were opened when a student friend from a senior course showed him a shabby book titled Revolutionary's Catechism, saying it contained the answer to Joseph's questions. However, he warned that the book was forbidden and one could be expelled or even put into jail for having it. Marxism was spreading over Russia and found a fertile ground in the minds of students who doubted their faith. Service to a new messiah. The hard-working people who were full of self-sacrifice. They compared themselves to the early Christians. Joseph felt that he had found his calling. At last, he had a goal and had found comrades who shared the same ideals. Together, they started attending meetings of an illegal Marxist group. He gave up his studies, stayed late in town, came home late, and spent hours in jail. Even his mother's persuasions did not help. She came to see her son, but found him in jail. When she asked why he was there, he said, for the book that showed how to overthrow the Tsar. She was terrified and begged him to give up his rebellious thoughts. His soul was torn between pity and anger towards her. There was no point in explaining as she would not understand. Keke looked at her son 
and did not recognize him. However, she felt that her precious son had gone down a wrong and dangerous road which she couldn't understand. But where did he get that confidence and that cold stare? These were the eyes of a man who knows what he wants. She did not know that Joseph had already met a person who would change his life forever. At the meetings of the Marxist group, he found a new friend, a senior student at the same seminary, George Georgiev, who became a world-renowned philosopher, occultist and astrologist. When he attended meetings, discussions about the forthcoming revolution always turned to mystical matters. Это, в общем-то, вот эта тяга к оккультной каким-то ритуалам магическим, скорее черно-магическим, среди эм, пламенных революционеров и большевиков, к сожалению, была распространена под маской материалистов, атеистов и борцов с этим самым, с религиозным сознанием. Они занимались чуть ли не магическими ритуалами. Gurdjieff possessed ancient magical knowledge. He showed his comrades some rituals, taught the fundamentals of astrology, and even predicted the future. It was Gurdjieff who told Stalin, you will become a great man and reign over millions of people. But if you want this, you will need to find your own path. He read this as meaning that the revolutionary struggle would bring him greatness. Koba left the seminary. He had nothing more to do there. He continued to attend the meetings of the Marxist group and found a regular job at the Tiflis Observatory. At that time, the observatory was not equipped with self-recording devices, and movement of celestial bodies was recorded manually during the day and at night. Koba's shift fell on December 31, 1899, the beginning of the 20th century, in which he was destined to play the most important historical figure on Earth. Nobody will ever know whether it was mere chance that Koba's shift had fallen on New Year's Eve 1900 and what he spoke to the stars about. But one thing is clear, he knew for sure that the stars governed human fate. Gurdjieff convinced him of that. We can only assume that it was that night at the beginning of a new century when looking at the stars and trying to understand their path that Joseph understood what Gurdjieff had meant by his words. A new way which Joseph had to choose and which would lead him to the summit of power, this was nothing more than a new horoscope. Changing the year of someone's birth could alter their whole life. Some researchers assume that it was Gurdjieff who chose a new date of birth for Stalin. There is no evidence to confirm this, but modern astrologists say that his horoscope was made by a highly qualified professional for a person who longed for unlimited power. For instance, the choice of December the 21st instead of December the 18th is more than fortunate for a future ruler. По древним календарям это день самой длинной ночи самого короткого дня когда наиболее активны темные силы. И когда появляется герой, который побеждает тьму. That's because a hero vested with huge power could be born on December the 21st and never on December the 18th, as Stalin had. В этом гороскопе, в его личном гороскопе, не было власти. Для этого нужно было сделать нечто другое, что он и сделал. И власть появилась. Pavel Glober helped us to match the meaning of positions of the Sun, the Moon and Mars in the Stalin's first and second horoscopes. Here are the results. 
the horoscope of the person born on December the 18th, 1878, Joseph Jugashvili date of birth, is that of a powerless and selfish person with many enemies. Maniacally stubborn, predisposed to brain diseases and poor health. In contrast to that, the person born on December the 21st, 1879 was the absolute opposite. He was destined to succeed in all his undertakings, would have glory and power and good health. He was straightforward, but would come to power through unkind means. Stalin publicly announced his new date of birth, but only 20 years after his first contact with the astrologist. Why did he spend 20 years working his way to the top under the original unflattering horoscope? Pavel Glober believes that as a mystic, Stalin believed he had to wait for the right moment when a new horoscope would become a vital necessity. And that moment came on April the 3rd, 1922. It was the date of the party convention which had to make a final decision whether Stalin would become the ruler of the state. His change date of birth и включение нового гороскопа для него был не просто так, а некий магический акт, на который он пошел сознательно, сделал это на съезде, меняет свою анкету, он зачеркивает свою дату, это сохранился, этот вот листок, где это все впервые он делает, потому что до этого в анкетах он фигурирует 1878 года. The years of birth clearly show that Joseph Jugashvili chose the new horoscope only when he became Stalin. The second horoscope says that year of birth to be 1879. Кот всегда считался по восточному календарю, это всегда очень хитрое и коварное, коварное существо, которое всегда действует из-под тяжка. Caution, careful consideration, guile and meanness. These are the traits which Stalin was known for. In the first horoscope, his year of birth was 1878, the year of the tiger. A person born in this year is characterized by ardor, fervor, enthusiasm, and recklessness. Koba was exactly like that when he started his ascent to power. Но ничего больше, скажем, умения и показателей на то, чтобы добиться высшего положения в обществе, в этом гороскопе нет. Сильная личность. Действительно такой идущий на крайние меры, но с ограниченными вот возможностями. Дата его рождения, вот та самая дата, которую он родился 18 декабря, это дата сильного человека, сильной личности, но скорее всего человек, который занимается террористической деятельностью, либо бандита, уголовника. That was the horoscope under which Stalin, then known as Koba, began his road to absolute power. He firstly became a member of the Tiflis Committee of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and organized Marxist meetings and demonstrations of workers in Tiflis and Batumi. Those demonstrations were broken up by the police and blood was shed. Koba was shocked. Although it was not the first time that he'd seen death, although back then it had been the death of his comrades at the hands of hostile strangers. Koba believed in a death for a death. The Caucasus choked with blood. Staying in immigration, Lenin was satisfied. We may say that open revolutionary movement has begun in the Caucasus. It was at that time that Lenin first reported about Koba, a reliable leader of the revolutionary underground in Georgia. That was the beginning of his career. And then there were the things that Stalin, the ruler, feared to think about until the end of his life. 
Things which, if disclosed, could deprive him of the most precious thing in his life, power. That is why he would thoroughly cover up any tracks and destroy any person who got in his way. Lenin and other leaders in immigration took every opportunity to acquire money. They organized armed robberies of banks and of capitalists. In the revolutionary business slang, it was called an X, expropriation. However, it was risky for the leaders to use their own hands. Besides, there was no need as long as there were reliable comrades in Russia. Koba eagerly tackled the job. He made his friends leaders of the gang. His childhood friend Simon Terpetrosian, aka Camo, and seminary mate Alexander Zvanidze. Over several weeks, the armed gang robbed many special purpose teams of the state bank with dozens of victims. But Lenin's reserves ran to hundreds of thousands of rubles. Only Kamo and Svanidze knew that those bloody exes were organized by Koba. That knowledge would cost them dearly in the future. Lenin learned about that from Koba and appreciated the help of a comrade from the Caucasus. Since then, Koba's career went uphill. At the same time, Koba came to the attention of the police. He was arrested and put into a cell with criminals. For the police, he was just another criminal. However, his cellmates saw that he was different. They thought that he might be a political leader. Maybe he fought against the Tsar. He should therefore be shown a lesson. Koba might be beaten to death, but when jail guards started beating the criminals, Koba acted in an unexpected way. He grabbed a weapon and started protecting his cellmates. Now it looked like a riot against jail abuse of power with Koba as the leader of the riot. At first, the criminals couldn't understand what had happened. Then he was exiled to Siberia, but escaped after two years. He returned back to Tiflis, where the police knew him by sight. Was it so difficult for the police to arrest Koba and send him to the place from which nobody could run away? It's incredible. He managed to remain in hiding for four years. The archives of the former gendarme department kept three reports about Jugashvili's arrests. He was arrested, but then released. He had organized bloody robberies, was a jailbreaker, a man outside the law with a forged passport. Why? There is only one explanation. Koba knew how to strike a deal not only with criminals, but with the secret political police as well. In other words, he cooperated with the police in exchange for his personal freedom. To be more precise, he betrayed his comrades. No direct evidence has been found as yet, which may be the reason why Stalin prohibited anyone rummaging through his past. We only know that living in hiding was the happiest and unhappiest time of his private life. During those four years, he met and lost his first love. Now they both were members of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, revolutionary underground comrades. It was at his comrade's house that Koba saw the younger sister of his comrade. He was shocked. The girl's resemblance to his mother was striking. It was no surprise that her name was Ekaterina Keke. It could not be otherwise. He was 25 and a tough revolutionary who had been through jail and exile. But beside that 19-year-old girl, he felt like young Soso again. He was so shy and tried hard to hide his passion for Cato. Finally, he asked her to marry him. Cato agreed. She was brought up in the Caucasian traditions and remembered the words of her deceased mother. 
Your husband is not the one who conquers you, but the one to whom you submit. The newlyweds settled at Svanidze's house. Cato's sister Maria often came to visit her, and Koba's underground comrade, Simon Terpatrosian, often visited. Alexander Svanidze and his wife always kept an open table and eagerly invited Koba, Cato, and their guests over. The men drank wine, joked, and quietly discussed their revolutionary plans. The women did not interfere and had their own conversations. These were the good times. Everybody was young and happy. The only blot on Cato's happiness were Koba's constant absences. Sometimes he'd be away for weeks. When he came back unexpectedly, he would always be greeted with a good meal. Koba was surprised. How did you know I was coming home today? She lowered her eyes shyly. I felt it. The Georgians have a tradition that still survives in places that a woman does not have the right to sit at a table with a man. She should stand beside him, ready to serve at any moment. But Koba breached this tradition intentionally. He vividly remembered how his father was outraged if his mother was unable to stand near the table, even though she had lots of work to do. He would not be like his father. Koba asked Kato to sit at the table beside him. He put food on her plate and sat so that he could look at her. Once, Alexander Svanitze came round and saw his sister sitting at the table. He threw her an indignant look. How dare she eat a lavish meal in the presence of her husband? Kato's heart stopped beating. She hoped Koba would explain that he liked to watch her eat. But instead, Koba started shouting and complaining that Kato was bad-mannered and ignored traditions. Svanidze could not look him in the eyes. When Alexander left, Koba started scolding his wife. He shouted and stamped his feet. Why hadn't she been sensible and hidden the plate under the table? As he was scolding Cato, he began to despise himself for behaving like his father, the man he hated and never wanted to resemble. Cato burst into tears. Her tears broke Koba's heart. He clasped her to his chest and whispered, Forgive me, Cato. She forgave him. But since then, uninvited guests would often find a place with unfinished supper under the table. Over the years, Koba's eccentricity would develop into a real mania for Stalin. He liked to force people to eat and drink, for when a person is eating or drinking, he is especially vulnerable. His actions were rebuffed only once when at a crowded reception in the Kremlin, he shouted at his second wife, Nadezhda Alilueva, Hey, why don't you drink? She replied, I am not your hey. Next morning, Nadezhda Alilueva was found dead. She had shot herself. In 1907, Cato gave birth to a son, Jakov. Koba saw him only in November, when he returned after a number of successful exes. When he arrived home, he was surprised to find supper was not on the table. Cato had a fever. After labor, she fell ill with typhus. In the morning, she died. Koba was destroyed. Witnesses said that during the funeral, he jumped into his wife's grave. He cried during the funeral and said, 
This creature made my stone heart turn soft. Now she is gone, and I have no warm feelings left for humanity. Koba would subsequently die, making way for Comrade Stalin's rise to power. At the summit of power, he would turn on the new horoscope to separate Stalin the ruler from the half-educated seminary student Jugashvili and the terrorist and criminal Koba forever. The new Stalin would need a new ideologically perfect biography written. There would be no room for any facts about the real Joseph Jugashvili. He would change his horoscope and his biography, but he could never change who he was. Сам Сталин самого себя от своего образа отделял. Вот образ Сталина вождя отразился в том гороскопе, который он включил для всего советского народа. Это Сталин вождь. Но жил он по своему собственному гороскопу, о котором мало кто знал. This dualism was the cause of his unending fear, the fear that he would be unmasked. The new Stalin was never able to renounce the ghost of his past, a past that did not match the image of a superman, an undisputable leader, a born ruler of the masses. This is the death mask of Joseph Stalin. Looking at it, you can easily understand what kind of a person he really was. Я, например, бы никогда не сказал, что это железный стальной человек. Вообще вот такие вот э, линии носа и э, глаз, вот выпуклые глаза, говорят о гордыне и деспотичности, о человеке, который был уверен в себе. Я говорю, единственной здесь чертой – это линия подбородка. Нетерпелив, горяч, вспыльчив, слишком пристрастен. Вот это действительно, к сожалению, это есть, реально. И, конечно, низко посаженные брови, брови э, человека, фиксирующегося на обидах. Вот откуда они ни, ни желания, ни умения прощать. Вот откуда жесткость и откуда такое подавление других. The only things that disclose his internal lack of self-confidence are his ears. Their position on the head is too low. Usually, such ears belong to people who are not destined to become great. However, these men can become great if they reinvent themselves. Это люди, учащиеся, которые учатся на своих ошибках. Очень редкая линия ушей. Для человека, который сам себя сделал, это ли эти линии ушей идеальные. Это которые все запоминают, которые живут в прошлом, для которых ни один день не является лишним и напрасным, которые постоянно возвращаются к тому, что они прожили раньше. Even having reinvented himself and gaining power, he turned his back on his past with maniacal consistency. As if waiting to be stabbed in the back by all those people who had witnessed the mistakes of his youth. From those who remembered his terrorist acts and robberies. And from those who suspected that Koba worked for the secret political police. Kamo, a faithful friend of Koba, died in 1922 under strange circumstances. He was run over by a car. This was odd, because there were very few cars in Tbilisi. Alexander Zvanidze, Koba's closest comrade and brother of his beloved wife, would be arrested and executed in August 1941. A little earlier, in 1937, Maria Svanidze, who had been a frequent guest of the younger sister Cato and her husband Joseph 30 years ago, would also be shot. Stalin hoped that if he killed anyone associated with his former life, there would be no one to unmask left to him. But he was wrong. Living a lie tormented him for the rest of his life. Gradually, that fear of being uncovered developed into paranoia for the tyrant who had ruined the lives of millions of innocent people.